Hear now the good news. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the spirit of truth and the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. word of prayer. Lord God, take the words that I have come up with and bless them with your Holy Spirit. May your Trinity shine through in all that we have done and said this day. In Christ's name, amen. I felt the need of prayer there because I've been struggling for 32 and a half years now with how to preach the Trinity. I've heard sermons that say it's like an ice cube, flowing solid and then flowing again. And then I've heard people say it's like the three musketeers, one for all and all for one, and on and on and on. And all of those sink to the level of heresy because they don't come anywhere near to describing the relationship that is the Holy Trinity. We struggle with the wholeness of God in many ways. As children, as a child, I was taught that God was this authoritarian thing up in the sky that watched and as soon as I made a mistake, pounced. I love the story that I'm going to share because it reflects that idea. There was a teacher teaching first grade in a large elementary school, and one morning all the teachers were called to the staff room for an emergency meeting. Had to be an emergency to take all the teachers out of the classrooms. And they hurried over, leaving their classes unsupervised. All of the teachers were worried, but none more so than one particular teacher because she knew her class was especially fond of mischievous and unruly things. So when they got to the staff room, the teacher decided to listen in and find out what was going on in her classroom, and sure enough, it was chaos. Children were yelling, jumping, and throwing things, but one little voice stood out above the rest, and she recognized that. She picked up the intercom, and in her sternest voice said, Elizabeth, sit down. There was immediate quiet, and then a meek little voice said, okay, God. That's somehow some semblance of what we think about God, you know, that God's always watching and, and, and we will pay the price for anything we do wrong, which is, of course, not what God is all about. Today is the Feast of the Holy Trinity, and I use the term feast, even though that's usually other denominations, because it talks about a relationship and a relationship that was often formed, bonded, and sealed around the table. Most of us understand Trinity as a doctrine of the church, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if that's the only understanding we have of the Trinity, we are cutting ourselves short, and we're leaving God out of a lot of our lives. We learned about the Spirit last week at Pentecost, we knew that God, the Father, God, the Creator, made the entire world. And we know that God, the Son, came to save us. But what are they, all three, together? And how do three make one? We pray to the Holy Trinity, offering ourselves, our joys, our sorrows, our concerns, our thanksgivings, and we do it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're baptized into new life in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And on a regular basis, we bless pets and things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are a Trinitarian people, 
We use the Trinitarian formula a lot, but we don't understand what it really means. And I could talk to each of you individually, and I would probably get a hundred different versions of what it means. So let's think about it in terms of relationship. From beginning to end and everything in between, our creation, birth, life, and death are constituted, sustained, and filled by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all together, not individually. So to see this day, this holy feast, as nothing more than a concept of numbers in which one equals three and three equals one, is like saying a wedding anniversary is simply the remembrance and celebration of the concept of love. Concepts whether of love or of the Holy Trinity, rarely, if ever, sustain or transform our lives. Instead, our lives are sustained and transformed by relationships and experiences. And the best relationship is the one that we form with God in all three parts. Today's reading from John's Gospel gets into a convoluted discussion where one Thing stands out. There is knowledge that must be gained over time. I suspect that most of you would not appreciate a sermon that began with, there are things that are essential to our faith, but I can't speak about them because you wouldn't be able to understand. That's basically what Jesus said to the disciples. I see you going, really? Of course, the reality is that there are many dimensions of our life in God that we don't understand, and we may not understand until we're seated at the heavenly banquet. In preparation for that day, I'm keeping a list. And it's gotten to be quite a long list of questions I want answered, of situations I want explained, and how come some really nasty folks never seem to pay for their sins. That's my list. You probably have your own list. I also feel confident that I and you stand in a long line of people who've asked questions. And if you haven't up to this point, start asking questions. Questions are what brings us closer to God in any of the three persons. Ask questions like Moses did. The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, said God, and they asked me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Who is this God? Who's called us? What are your questions? Just like that. So much seems to go unanswered, both in the Bible and in our lives. Therefore, it's disconcerting each and every time I come about upon Jesus' observation that I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. If it was anybody but Jesus, I would call them patronizing at the very least. What I want to know is, what is it that you know that we don't yet? And why aren't we ready to hear it? We've heard so many things and believed so many things, and yet... You won't tell us this, even though you're merciful, pure in heart, and love the world. And yet there are things that you won't tell us because we cannot bear it. And therein lies the rub, because we cannot bear it. God is God and we are not. And God knows things that we do not. And yes, there are things that God waits to tell us, like why bad things happen to good people and why people who are rotten never seem to pay the piper and why there are poor people and why there are violent people and why there are wars and why there's peace in some places and not in others I mean the questions go on and on there are things we simply do not know at this point but we're told in the future In the unfolding of time, we will be told them. And we will hear it from the spirit of truth. Who hears it from Jesus, who got it from God. And so they're all the same. And we will hear what we need to hear at the time we need to hear it. 
in that little piece of scripture, we're giving a portrait of the three persons of the Trinity. Jesus speaks of himself, of the Spirit's activities, and of the Father. The Holy Trinity is definitely one of those difficult, challenging, thought-provoking doctrines of our faith. I love to hear really educated theologians try to struggle with it. Ultimately, they come down to it's a mystery. And nobody can understand all the mysteries of God. And yes, that's satisfying on one level, but boy, it sure would be nice to have it just laid out and explained for us, wouldn't it? In John's gospel, the Spirit is associated primarily with Jesus. Jesus said he was coming. He came at Pentecost. Jesus told the disciples to listen to him. And then Jesus took off leaving the uh, advocate, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. But it was mentioned many times before that in the Bible. Jesus said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit because Jesus was not yet glorified. That's in John 7. John the baptizer gives witness to the fact that after baptizing Jesus, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove. That's John 1. He had been told that this would be the sign that this person would be the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John 1.33. Early in his ministry, Jesus introduced the Spirit into his conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus. How central is the Spirit? Jesus declares, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. John 3. Jesus explained to the unnamed Samaritan woman, God is Spirit. But it's during his farewell message that Jesus more fully explores and explains the spirit that he was to give his disciples. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, John 20. And in his farewell message and prayer, Jesus weaves the connection between God the Father himself and the spirit. So how are we to know God? How are we to know who God is as Creator, Father, as Spirit, Advocate, Comforter, as Son, Savior, Jesus. How are we to know? The answer is simple, and Jesus told us this. We know God because we've known Jesus. Once we know Jesus, then we know God. Because all that God is, Jesus is, and all that Jesus is, the Spirit is, and all the Spirit is, God is. And it goes like that. So the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them. You, Father, are in me and I am in you. John 17. The proclamations he made, what Jesus taught, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does this work. John 14. Jesus speaks the words of Father and the Spirit. The paraclete, another word for spirit, will not speak on his own or speak whatever he hears. From Jesus, the Father speaks to Jesus, who speaks to the Spirit, who will guide you into all the truth. Still not enough, is it? Because we hunger for the details. We want to know how God does it. And what God says is, relax into me and let me do what I do. And when the time comes for you to know the details, you will know them. The Spirit will tell them. And so we have to get out of our modern day instant everything in a hurry and get into God's time. And God's time, once you're in it, is one of the most beautiful places to be because it takes away all the stress and the anger and the anxiety of the world in which we live. After Christ's resurrection and ascension, the apostles and disciples also found that God in Christ continued fully to be with them in the person of the Holy Spirit, just like Christ had promised. Thus, the one God of the Old Testament was fully present in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He was one in three persons, not only the Father, but also the Son and the Holy Spirit, all are wholly divine. Only the Son, as Jesus, took on 
fully human status and incarnated in human flesh. The Son who is with us is God. The Holy Spirit who comes to us is God. They are not lesser deities than the Father. And to all of them, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, we pray and we give our adoration. And that brings me back to where I started. The Holy Spirit is about relationship and the indwelling of God in each of us. It's about collaboration and the self-communication of God. The Trinity is about the mutuality of God within the one, about our invitation into the one by Jesus in the power of the paraclete Holy Ghost Spirit. And it's about our mutuality with each other, guiding, speaking, and declaring to one another the glory of God, whether it be God, Father, Creator, Jesus, Son, or Holy Spirit. The Trinity is our way of life made possible because of God. Thanks be to the one true God. Amen.